You're standing on the roof of a control tower at the airport. You see a huge plane coming in for a landing. It's whizzing over your head, but all you hear is the wind whistling. The first sound the plane makes is the scraping of the tires against the asphalt. That's because this giant airplane runs on electricity. It doesn't need to burn tons of fuel. And it doesn't attract the attention of passersby with its noise as it flies over the city. But engineers predict that all electric airplanes won't appear for another couple of decades. For now, the Dreamliner 787, which can carry 310 passengers and emits no pollution, remains a sweet dream for designers. Let's jump back in time to 140 years ago. In 1883, a French aviation enthusiast made the first ever electric-powered flight. He installed an electric engine on the dirigible. The problem was that the engine weighed as much as a big motorcycle. So the dirigible couldn't fly long distances and lift many passengers. Okay, back to our time. The problem of heavy engines and batteries remains unsolved. One pound of regular airplane fuel contains 60 times more energy than one pound of even the most advanced battery. So we'd have to increase the airplane's tank by 60 times and fill it with batteries. But now the plane is much heavier and it can barely take off. So we have to remove a lot of necessary things from the plane, like several rows of seats, toilets, and all the drinks and snacks. So the plane loses some weight. And now, shove more batteries into all the empty places. The plane can take off now, but it can't land. The plane is designed to take off with a full tank and land with almost nothing. Otherwise, its landing gear just can't take the load and breaks when it touches the ground. So if the plane needs to make an emergency landing right after takeoff, it'll have to circle over the airport until it's burned enough fuel. It's allowed to land only when it reaches a certain weight. But in the case of batteries, the weight of the plane doesn't change during the flight. So designers had to find another solution. Let's drive this little single-engine airplane into a hangar and take out the old fuel-burning engine, exhaust system, and fuel tank. Replace them with an electric engine, which is much smaller and lighter. Pack all free spaces with batteries. The weight of the final version of the plane should remain exactly the same as the original plane. So now, it can take off and fly without any problems. But it can only do that for short distances. And that's a huge advantage of electric planes. About half of all flights in the world are under 500 miles. There's a lot of flights over distances like that, from New York to Washington, D.C., or from Detroit to Toronto. It's less than 200 miles. And there are huge passenger planes flying on those flights. They take off, gain altitude, and then immediately land. Using these gas burners at such short distances is like putting a huge freight elevator in a two-story house. It's not profitable, and it doesn't make sense. All the conventional airplanes in the world emit about 1 billion tons of CO2 a year. So we can reduce the amount of damage to the environment by half by using electric planes. Many designers are trying to convert some planes into electric ones. For example, the Cessna 208B E Caravan. The normally nine-seat passenger plane now uses an electric engine. As of 2020, it's undergoing certification. This means that every bolt and wire on the plane is tested for safety. This process could take years. ES-19 is an all-electric four-engine airplane. The aluminum hull makes it extremely light. Although the price per unit is about $8.8 .8 million, its maintenance costs are 90% less than regular airplanes. And electric power for the plane itself is 50 to 75% cheaper than standard fuel. It'll be able to cover distances of about 220 miles. It's great for traveling in Europe or between remote islands. And it can use runways no longer than 2,500 feet. Given that these planes are practically silent, airports could be built close to city centers. This would cut travel time almost in half. Aviation Alice has taken another step into the future. This nine-seat plane is made almost entirely of composite materials and powered by three engines. The inverted boat shape and V-shaped tail make its aerodynamics perfect. It has the length of a school bus and the wingspan as wide as a basketball court. Its maximum takeoff weight is like two SUVs. 60% of that weight is batteries. This gives it the ability to fly distances of about 620 miles. That's more than the distance from New York to Detroit. The best thing about the Aviation Alice is the economy. Flying nine passengers and two crew at top speed will cost about $200 an hour. For conventional planes of the same class, like Cessna and Beechcraft, that number would be about five times bigger. The problem of short-range flights can be solved by a network of abandoned airports in the United States. 
There are about 2,000 of them and 5,000 public airports. Each of them can be equipped with a charging station, just like a gas station. A half hour at a charging station for Alice would be equal to one hour of flying in the air. So while passengers are getting off and on and their luggage is being loaded, the plane can build up enough energy to fly. So small planes are good as an air taxi or private jet, but you need at least 20 Aviation Alice planes to replace a full-fledged Boeing 737 with 180 passengers. The price for one electric bird is $4 million. So that's $80 million versus $100 million for one Boeing. So the Alice wins again. The plane had been in the air for a mere 25 seconds when the pilots noticed weird noises and bizarre vibrations. They tried several ways to improve the situation, but nothing worked. The engine surges continued. And just over a minute into the flight, when the plane reached 3,000 feet, both engines failed. First the right one, two seconds later the left one. The pilots decided to return to the airport they had just left. At the same time, they tried to restart the engines. Nothing seemed to work. The flight crew made a decision to pitch the plane down and then level it off. Perhaps it could help them gain some speed for the glide. But soon, they realized they wouldn't make it to the airport. Was the plane going to crash? That's when the miracle at Gotrura occurred. The morning before the flight started as usual. Regular pre-flight procedures, good weather. The members of the flight crew were experienced pilots. A 44-year-old Danish captain with over 8,000 flight hours under his belt and a 34-year-old first officer from Sweden with 3,000 hours. So what could go wrong? The plane itself was almost brand new. It was a McDonnell Douglas MD-81 nicknamed Dana Viking. It made its first flight on March 16, 1991. By that fateful day, the aircraft had been in service for a mere nine months. There were 122 passengers and seven crew members on board. Flight 751 Scandinavian Airlines was a scheduled flight from Stockholm, Sweden to Warsaw, Poland. On the way, the plane was supposed to make a stop in Copenhagen, Denmark. The aircraft took off from Stockholm according to its schedule at 8.47 a.m. local time. But by that point, the people inside had already been doomed, all because of a terrible sequence of events before the departure. It started the night before. The plane arrived at Stockholm Airport after a flight from Zurich. It was 10.09 p.m. The aircraft spent the night at the gate outside. It was cold. The temperature dropped to 34 degrees Fahrenheit, just above freezing. What made the situation even worse was that almost 6,000 pounds of freezing cold fuel, chilled during the night, still remained in the tanks located in the wings. The fuel was so cold because the plane had been flying at the cruising altitude, where the air temperature outside the cabin varied from minus 61 to minus 80 degrees. The flight from Zurich lasted around 1 hour and 40 minutes. Soon after midnight, a flight technician came to check on the aircraft. The man had to remove some slush from the landing gear, otherwise he wouldn't be able to examine it. At around 2 a.m., when he was leaving, he noticed some ice covering the upper part of the wings. By the morning, the situation had become even dire. A layer of clear, almost invisible ice had formed on the tops of the wings. The plane had to leave the gate at around 8.30 a.m. An hour before the departure, the mechanic responsible for the plane noticed that some ice covered the underside of the wings. He decided to make sure there was no ice on the tops of the wings. He climbed a ladder and put one knee on the wing. Then he bent forward to touch the front part of the wing. There was no ice, just some slush. The mechanic decided to make sure everything was fine with the air inlet of one of the engines. He didn't find anything abnormal. Soon after that, the personnel used more than 220 gallons of de-icing fuel to remove ice from the plane. The mechanic consulted with the captain of the aircraft and ordered the staff to de-ice the underside of the wings as well. After all, he had seen some ice there. But no one thought to double-check if there was clear ice on the tops of the wings. After they had finished the procedure, the mechanic reported to the captain, uh, We're done here. De-icing finished. There was a lot of snow and ice, but everything's clear now. 
The captain thanked the mechanic and carried on with the pre-flight procedures. The plane taxied to the runway. Its engine's anti-ice systems were switched on and didn't show any malfunction. But several passengers later claimed they had seen ice sliding off the upper side of the wings while the plane had been taking off. And still, the plane left the ground and headed for Stockholm as usual. But shortly after the takeoff, several pieces of the overlooked ice broke off. At full speed, they slammed into the fans of the engines near the tail on both sides of the plane, ruining the blades. It led to a series of surges, and the rest is history. Meanwhile, somewhere in the cabin, Scandinavian Airlines flight captain Per Holmberg, who was on board as a passenger, noticed something was amiss. At first, he informed the flight attendant sitting in the rear jump seat that the right engine was surging. She tried to contact the flight crew unsuccessfully. Then the ununiformed captain rushed to the cockpit and asked if he could help the pilots. The first officer gave him the emergency checklist, and the captain asked him to start the auxiliary power unit, a small gas turbine in the tail of the plane. Holmberg's advice and help were invaluable, but was it enough to save the plane and the people inside? When the plane emerged from the cloud cover at an altitude of 890 feet, the pilots realized they wouldn't have enough time to make it back to the airport. An immediate emergency landing was unavoidable. The assisting captain passed the order to the cabin crew, and they started preparing the passengers. There was a large field to the north of the plane, but the captain realized they didn't have enough time to reach it. So he chose a much smaller field in a forested area in the direction of flight. It was not far from the village of Gotrura in upland Sweden. The plane was just 1,300 feet above the ground when the assisting captain started extending the flaps. At a height of 183 feet, the captain reported to Stockholm Control, we're crashing to the ground. Seven seconds later, the plane hit several trees and lost a huge chunk of its right wing. By that time, the landing gear had already been extended and the speed had decreased to 139 miles per hour. Moments later, the plane's tail struck the ground and broke off. The aircraft kept sliding across the field, still at high speed. It traveled 360 feet, with its main landing gear leaving marks on the field. At one point, the plane lost the main and nose landing gear. Its fuselage broke into three parts. Miraculously, there was no fire. If you look at the pictures from the crash site, the plane torn into pieces, with its parts scattered across the field, it's hard to believe that all 129 people on board the plane survived. That little yellow hook you can see from the airplane's window if you're sitting next to the wing is there to help you in case of an emergency landing. Inflatable slides can only be deployed from the emergency exit doors in the front and the tail of the plane. In the middle, the passengers would have to walk right out on the wing and get to the ground from there. But jumping from the plane wing isn't safe because it's just too high. And here's where those little yellow hooks come in handy. The flight attendants tie ropes from the doors and through the loops for the passengers to hold on to. This way, everyone can safely get to the ground without injuries. Now, you want to try to avoid cozying up under airplane blankets. Some airlines only wash them about once a month. Better use your own travel blanket, a scarf, or a jacket. And always remember to wear your shoes while walking around the plane. That carpet on the floor can't and won't be cleaned to perfection between flights. It's just too much time and effort for the cabin crew. The dirtiest place on a plane isn't the bathroom. It's your tray table. It has 8 times more bacteria than an onboard toilet flush button. Now, in case of emergency, oxygen masks only have enough airflow to last for about 15 minutes. Luckily, it's just the amount of time a plane needs to find a suitable landing place or to at least descend to the altitude where people won't need oxygen masks anymore. You may wonder why you're asked to lift your seat back and close your tray table before takeoff and landing, but it's for your own safety. A reclined seat is comfy for you, but it makes it harder for the passenger behind you to get out of their seat, which is crucial in case of an emergency. The lower tray table is the same way, 
Only this time, it's you who won't be able to stand up fast enough if anything happens. Besides, the tray table prevents you from assuming the secure position in the event of an emergency landing. This position requires you to bend over in your seat, put your head between your knees, and cover the back of your head with your hands. Imagine doing that while your tray table is open. If you look around the cabin, you'll notice little black or red triangles around the midsection of the plane. These stickers let the flight attendants know where the airplane wings are located so they can immediately look out the right window to see if something is amiss outside. You shouldn't lower the window shades while taking off, taxiing, or landing for two reasons. First, the flight attendants must always be able to monitor the situation outside, and open shades help them with that, obviously. Second, if something's gone wrong on board the plane while it's on the ground, for example, a fire, the ground crews won't be able to see it and evaluate the situation before going in unless the windows are open. That tiny hole you see at the bottom of any airplane window isn't there to scare you nuts. In fact, it helps keep the pressure from the inside and the outside of the window equalized. The hole itself is only made in the second layer of glass, and there are three of them overall, which also helps with security, by the way. Even if the outer glass breaks, there will still be two more to keep you safe. Now, you might see flight attendants touching the overhead compartments while they're walking along the aisle, but that's not exactly what they do. Right beneath the compartments, there's usually a handrail that goes all the way through the cabin, so you can also use this trick to stay firmer on your feet in the aisle. The pilots dim the lights in the cabin during nighttime not for you to get cozy and sleepy. Our eyes have a hard time adjusting to darkness in the first few minutes of sudden lights out. And in the case of emergency, every second matters. So the lights get dimmed to let you get used to darkness in case something happens and you have to act fast. Pay attention to the aisle floor, too. If there's an emergency landing at night, there will be two luminescent strips along the aisle showing you the way to the exit. Follow them to get safely out of the plane. Flight attendants also suggest counting the seats between you and the emergency exit once you're seated. This will help you navigate in case there's no other guidance available. If a lightning bolt hits the plane, the passengers won't feel it. The entire aircraft is covered with aluminum coating that conducts electrical current and doesn't let it inside. This protection is tested using a lightning simulator. Airplane windows are round because the air pressure is evenly distributed this way. If the plane's windows were square, strong air currents would accumulate in the corners of the windows, depressurizing the cabin. And that's bad. Don't think you become untouchable if you go to the airplane toilet. The bathroom door can be open from the outside. There's usually a small latch at the top of the door that allows cabin crew to get you out of there. It's useful for both getting to people doing something suspicious in the bathroom and helping those who don't feel well and, for example, collapsed while in the toilet. Yeah, let's avoid doing that. The plane's wings flash red and green lights at night to show the direction the plane is heading in. A green light is always on the right wing, and a red one is on the left. Aircraft tires are designed to withstand 4-5 to five times more pressure than they actually experience upon landing. The wheel is more likely to break than the tire. Pilots always have different meals. This is necessary to reduce the risk of food poisoning. The flight can still go well if one of the pilots has gone down because of a stale burrito, but not if it's both of them. And try not to both of you eat the fish. Some airlines don't allow pilots to have beards. Facial hair can prevent securely fitting the oxygen mask. And pilots must always remain conscious. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.